Hello everyone, um, my name is Maggie Murphy and my project was looking at a long-term management plan for the Henry Street Salamander Tunnels. Um, my partner organization was the Hitchcock Center for Education. On the outline for my presentation, I'm going to show you guys my abstract um, and then go through the introduction, the project goals, methods, results, recommendations, and then I'll also have my literature cited at the end. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read my very long abstract, um, but I'll go over most of it throughout the presentation. Uh, now I will go into my introduction. Uh, approximately one-fifth of the land area in the U.S. experiences ecological effects of roadways. Uh, amphibians are at especially high risk due to concentrated breeding migrations. Uh, adults will migrate from the uplands to vernal pool habitats, and that is when the most mortalities occur. There are very few studies done on amphibian crossings, um, but I'd like to go over a couple that show some very significant numbers to mortalities. Uh, a New York study showed that 53% to 100% mortality rate uh, for crossing salamanders. And in Ontario, Canada, a study found 32,000 individuals killed over a 3.6 kilometer section of roadway in two years. Um, at Henry Street in Amherst, Massachusetts, road mortality of the spotted salamander was a significant local concern for the town people in Amherst in the late 1980s. Um, Henry Street is a main road in Amherst that could not be closed off for the migration periods. Um, it would cause traffic delays and backups if they did. Um, so the British Flora and Fauna Preservation stepped in because they had installed other amphibian tunnels in Great Britain and the UK and they wanted a to put their foot in the door in the United States so the British Fauna and Flora Preservation Society and ACO Polymer helped fund the tunnels and they also had help from the town of Amherst and UMass Amherst which I did not list um, these were the first salamander tunnels installed in the United States in 1987. Um, this is just a brief picture of the project site and where the salamander tunnels are located. Um, on our right we have the hibernation area where most of the salamanders will migrate from. Um, in blue you have the drift fences, the little yellow marks on the roadway are where the tunnels are located um, and then the red line shows the extent of salamander crossings um, although salamanders have been known to cross here there is very little known about the crossing efficacy of tunnels for amphibian populations and currently there is very limited research on the subject. Uh, so now I'd like to so now I'd like to briefly go over uh, what I did for methods um, for the life histories. Uh, this, uh, the Hitchcock Center wanted to go over specific species and emphasize them in the report, um, which were spotted salamanders, wood frog, spring peepers and four-toed salamanders, which all occur at the Henry Street habitat. Um, I also wanted to emphasize potential vernal pool species to occur at the site. Um, it's very important to understand why these species use vernal pools and what their requirements are for upland habitat. Um, and as part of this, I am gonna go over threats to populations, especially uh, those threats that are a direct concern to the Henry Street populations. Um, and then I went over and 
looked at the infrastructure of the Henry Street Salamander Tunnels and looked at what the current um, conditions are, such as damage to roadway, uh, drift fencing and stuff, and the Hitchcock Center also provided a list that they compiled in 2014 of the infrastructure conditions. Um, I also did a review of wildlife tunnels. Um, this was important to understand uh, the importance of wildlife tunnels around the globe, northeast, and locally. Um, I did my main focus was on reptile and amphibian tunnels. Um, since the since the Henry Street tunnels were the first installed in the United States, um, I looked at ones that were installed after, um, because the ones that were installed before were mainly in Europe. Um, this also helped me to determine what the current efficacy of tunnels in general were. Then I also looked at citizen science and monitoring programs. Uh, the Hitchcock Center places a strong emphasis on educating um, and inspiring action for a healthy planet, so they really wanted to look at what their citizen science program was around the tunnels. Um, and right now, their current citizen science program focuses on conservation of adults through helping them cross over the road. Um, so I wanted to also explore if there are other options to expand this, such as like what are other people doing. And then as far as land acquisition programs, um, there is a concern for protection of upland habitats surrounding the vernal pools um, because they are owned by private landowners, and there are no conservation easements on that land. Um, so as part of that, I researched potential land acquisition programs in the area. And then finally, uh, the Hitchcock Center wanted to look at any potential funding opportunities. Um, so I looked at potential grants surrounding salamanders or potential expansion of citizen science programs. Um, and now I'm going to go over the results. So first I'd like to go over vernal pool habitats. I'm going to go over what a vernal pool is and the a brief life history of each of the species that I looked at. So in Massachusetts, a vernal pool is defined as a confined basin depression with no permanent above ground outlet. It must hold water for two consecutive months in most years, lacks an established reprodu reproducing fish population, um, typically fills in autumn or spring in most years. It dries completely in the summer of most years. There are cases where they don't, depending on how wet the year is, um, and it contains obligate vernal pool species. Um, in Massachusetts in particular, they place a strong emphasis on looking if obligate vernal pool species are in the pool, uh, the potential vernal pool um, to determine whether or not it is a vernal pool. So as far as vernal pool species are, um, there are a few that are obligate, meaning that they only occur or use vernal pools for breeding. Um, that is the wood frog, the spotted salamander, the blue spotted salamander, the Jefferson salamander, marbled salamander, and fairy shrimp. Um, and the ones that occur at Henry Street that we know of are the wood frog, the spotted salamander, but there are also other species found at Henry Street, such as the four-toed salamander and the spring peeper. I wanted to also focus on ones that did not or are not known to occur at the Henry Street um, Salamander Tunnels because some of them do have the potential to occur, but based on their life cycles, it's hard to monitor those types of populations. The first species is the wood frog. Um, the wood frogs are found um, far away from water in mesic forests during the summer months. Uh, they hibernate under forest floor debris or wet meadows and can survive partially frozen. 
and they are only associated water for breeding purposes. They breed and deposit eggs from March to July, um, and the egg masses are fist-sized blobs that can contain up to 15,000 individuals. Uh, the spring peeper, this one is best known and easy, easily identified by their sharp peeping call heard from wetlands in the early spring. Um, females will produce up to 800 eggs, and the eggs can either be laid singularly or in clusters attached to vegetation at the bottom of the pool. Um, adults will eat small aquatic insects, mites, ticks, and snails. The spotted salamander, which is the highlighted species of concern at the Henry Street Salamander Tunnels. Um, their upland habitat is mesic forest within a half mile of a vernal pool. Um, they're fossil, meaning they bury, they burrow under logs and soft soils. Um, and they also are nocturnal feeders. Um, they will reap, they will start migration in the early spring during nights of uh, that are over 40 degrees Fahrenheit and raining. Um, females will lay egg masses surrounded by a gelatinous matrix and can consist of 30 to 50 individuals. Um, the adults diet is mainly invertebrates and the juveniles are things such as zooplankton, but, uh, cannibalism can, can occur in overcrowded pools. The blue marbled salamander is similar to the spotted salamander in its habitat and behaviors and reproduction, uh, but the females can lay up to 100 to 500 individual eggs across the pool um, as individual eggs instead of egg masses, so they're very hard to detect versus the bigger egg masses of the spotted salamander. And the adults and juveniles diet is also very similar. The Jefferson salamander is not known to occur at the Henry Street salamander tunnels um, and is a actually a very rare uh, salamander to see. Um, they're usually found in undisturbed deciduous forest in steep rocky areas um, with logs. They hide under leaf litter in small animal burrows, stones, or logs. Um, they will migrate before most salamanders from February, February to April on rainy nights, and sometimes the pools will only be partially thawed. Um, females will lay up to 250 eggs, ranging from 6 to 80 eggs per mass. The eggs will usually hatch before the arrival of the spotted salamander. And their diet is very similar to those of other salamanders. The marbled salamander uh, is also not known to occur at the Henry Street salamander tunnels, but they do have very similar requirements. Um, they need upland mesic forests within a half a mile of vernal pool, and they're also fossil, meaning they burrow under logs and soft soils. Um, they, but they, unlike the other salamanders, will migrate to vernal pools in late August through early October. Um, so this means that the pools will have to fill up in the late, in the fall. Um, they will lay um, five to two hundred transparent eggs that darken with soil. The females remain with the eggs, unlike other salamander species or most salamander species until vernal pool pools fill up with water or they will abandon them if it does not fill up before winter. Um, eggs will not hatch until they are flooded with water. The four-toed salamander is known to occur around the vicinity of the Henry Street salamander tunnels. Um, it is easily identified because it has four toes on each of its feet, unlike other salamanders. They also have a constriction at the base of the tail, which is a defense mechanism where the tail will break off if attacked, and the tail will wriggle around and distract the predator. 
so the sound later can make his escape. Um, it has similar upland habitat to others. Um, it will hide in moss or moist decay wood under stones or wet leaves. And it does not solely rely on vernal pools for breeding. Um, it will breed in various types of wetlands, but sphagnum moss is required for nest building. Um, females will, le will lay clutches of 12 to 20 eggs in March to April or May. Nests are placed along the margin of a pond or on a moss-covered log projecting over the water. Um, these nests are placed at an angle so the larvae, upon hatching, can wiggle down the slope to the water. And lastly is the fairy shrimp. Um, fairy shrimp only occur in vernal pools. Um, they swim through the water upside down, beating their appendages rhythmically, and their appendages are also a part of the respiratory system. They are usually well camouflaged by leaves and may be only seen by the white forked tail from above. Um, females will produce several clutches throughout the duration of the vernal pool being filled with water. Um, eggs must dry out completely and become resubmerged before hatching. Um, eggs are drought and cold resistant and can resist ingestion by animals. Um, now we'll go over the greatest threats to these populations. Um, the first and highest risk for populations are roadkill. Um, crossing roads can be a long journey for some species and they are rarely seen by drivers. Um, or when they are, it is often too late. Uh, amphibians, in particular, have a 98% risk of road mortality per crossing attempt. Um, there are ho hot spots um, along roadways because they move in mass migrations in the springtime uh, to wetlands in usually one night. Um, the second greatest threat is barrier effects. Um, roads can act as barriers to movement for animals. If they cannot reach their habitats that are needed for foraging or breeding, it can be detrimental to populations. Um, they usually, with barrier effects, will try to avoid crossing of roads. And this is usually because pavement is not a natural substrate that they're used to crossing. Or... They will avoid being near moving cars because of noise or visual cues. Uh, now we'll go over the salamander tunnels. Uh, uh, the current design of the salamander tunnels at Henry Street, they are made from polymer concrete. Uh, this was chosen because they are resistant to oil, gas, and salts, unlike regular Portland cement. Um, there are small tops in the tunnels that run the length of the tunnels, and these allow moisture, humidity, and light into the tunnels. Um, there are concrete headwalls and drift fencing at either end. Uh, the drift fencing on either side are di is different. Um, on the eastern side, a plastic mesh was used because it was thought that the smaller adults that had just gone through the metamorphosis stage could pass through the holes. On the western side, metal flashing was used, um, and I believe this was used for the potential resilience towards roadway salts and pollutions, since they are located so close to the road. Um, and I have a few pictures showing a drawing that was done um, of a general salamander tunnel. Um, the tunnels at the Henry Street ones are not two feet by two feet like it is shown on this diagram, but the overall everything else is the same. Um, this is a, a side view of the tunnel showing a stabilized entrance, which is an asphalt pad, a dry well, a wing wall, and retaining wall. Um, the Henry Street Tunnels also do not have a retaining wall, and instead they use drift fencing. 
this is a top view of a salamander tunnel um, entrance, and this also shows the stabilized uh, entrance pad, drywall, wing wall, and retaining wall. And like I said before, the Henry Street ones do not have a retaining wall. Um, this one also emphasizes that the grates need to be flush with the road, um, so when cars go over it, there's not a bump. And then here's a front view also showing how the grate is flush with the road. Um, and now I'm going to go over the current condition of the salamander tunnels. Um, there are quite a few damaged areas to the tunnels due to normal wear and tear. Um, there, the asphalt and the concrete head walls are deteriorating, um, and so are the cement wing walls. Um, the asphalt on the roadway next to the tunnels is cracking, and you can see that in the, the bottom picture. Um, and not pictured are the wooden posts on the roads, um, which are near the um, tunnel entrances. Um, those are either broken and I believe there is one missing. And the concrete berms are also damaged. Um, the drift fences are not attached properly to the wing walls. Um, as you can see in the middle picture, they are currently being held onto the wing walls by sandbags. Um, and metal flashing. And they are damaged in many areas, such as you see on the top picture where it's almost completely curled over. Um, and the choice of material in mesh actually allows for the salamanders to climb over the fencing instead of being directed towards the entrance of the tunnels. Um, and then also not pictured is the drywalls, which we saw in um, the diagrams in the previous slides. Uh, those fill with dirt and debris during rain events, which causes flooding in the tunnels. Uh, now I'm going to go over the results of monitoring amphibian populations. Um, these are the current efforts that are happening at the Henry Street Salamander Tunnels. Um, they are doing salamander bucket brigades where they physically help the adults on migration nights cross over the road safely by collecting them and putting them over the other side. Uh, unfortunately, they don't have adult counts or they didn't provide me with adult counts. Um, and then they also sometimes do egg mass counts. Um, these are scattered between 1993 and 2018, and not they haven't been done yearly. Um, so it doesn't really allow for sufficient data trends to be determined, especially when the numbers of adults crossing are not always recorded for the big migration night in the spring, which are when they do the salamander bucket brigades. Um, there are other potential monitoring methods that others have used. The first is camera traps. Um, there are a few different camera traps that are used to monitor populations. Um, the first one and the most common one is passive infrared camera trapping. Um, for this one, the animal must be 2.7 degrees Celsius warmer than the surrounding environment. And amphibians rarely exceed three degrees Celsius. Um, so, it cannot be reliably used to detect ectotherms, such as amphibians. Um, th there is a very recent study where they made a new camera trap called the Hobbs Active Light Trigger Camera Trap, which uses a pre-aligned near-infrared mount parallel to an elevated threshold that will specifically target a small animal crossing over. Um, this one has great potential, obviously, but unfortunately it is not commercially available yet because it is such a new technology. Uh, and then finally, they have time-lapse camera traps, which have been used for amphibians crossing into tunnels. Um, and these are great because they can be programmed to take videos or pictures throughout a set time of day or night. 
and they do not rely on movement or hit or heat triggers. Uh, and there's also different conservation efforts on individual salamanders, specifically on the different salamander life stages. Um, first is the adult stage, and it's when migrating adults will um, go to breeding ponds. Um, and this migration is triggered by rain and temperature, uh, usually in the early spring or late winter. And this is where the Henry Street... Um, salamander tunnels and the Hitchcock Center focus their conservation efforts on. Uh, a study also showed uh, looking at the metamorph stage, which is when the larvae reach maturity and leave the breeding pond. Uh, this one's a little trickier to determine when to go out and monitor for them uh, because the migration is only triggered by rain, so it's difficult to determine like I said, when to go out. And then another interesting point is uh, volunteers. Most of the time with efforts like this, such as helping salamanders cross the road or counting of animals, um, they want a large number to come out so they have more hands on deck. Um, for the study, um, that I looked at in particular, it showed that numbers are not as important as the distribution of volunteers throughout the site. Uh, and now I'll go over the little known efficacy of the tunnels. Um, so there are a few events where the salamander tunnels uh, were looked at on how many adults will cross over the road using the tunnels specifically. So in 1988, a year after the salamander tunnels were installed, um, Scott Jackson, who was a professor at UMass and who also helped determine what to install at the site, did a study and it showed that 75.9% of the salamanders were using the tunnels um, but later on in 2016 through 2018 a postdoctoral student who worked under Scott Jackson uh, looked at the salamander tunnels again um, and he showed drastically different numbers so in 2016 there was only 11.2 percent that used the tunnels uh, in 2017 13.9 percent in 2018, 7%. This suggests either there has been a decrease in the population numbers in the habitats surrounding Henry Street, or the salamanders are using other means to cross the roads. Um, and since there's no other tunnels, uh, it is most likely that individuals are making their way over the fences and crossing over the roadway. Um, there are a few problems with the tunnels and them using the tunnels. First of all is the mesh fencing. And the mesh, mesh fencing has been found to actually create footholds for the salamanders to crawl over. And then there's also a concern with bulking, uh, which means that the salamanders are hesitating at the entrance of the tunnels before going through or just completely turning around. Um, and there are a few explanations as to why they are bulking. Um, either the tunnels are too small, um, many other tunnels that were installed after the Henry Street tunnels are much bigger than the Henry Street tunnels, and because they are too small, there might be a difference in humidity, humidity temperature, light, or airflow in the tunnels versus the outside environment. Uh, now I'm going to go over a few studies of other amphibian tunnels. Unfortunately for this project and for me, there are not uh, very many studies of the efficacy of salamander tunnels. Um, but there are a few that looked specifically at the infrastructure surrounding tunnels. 
Um, the first is a study by Patrick um, in 2010. They tested the variation of length, substrate, width, and position on a gradient of the tunnels. Uh, they found that there was a marginal difference between the tunnels of different substrates and positions on gradient. Um, as well as width. Um, but there was a preference in length of tunnel, which the Henry Street tunnels fall within the preferred length. Um, unfortunately, during this study, the width of the salamander tunnel that was the smallest that they used uh, was still about 50% greater than the width of the current salamander tunnels at Henry Street. Um, Scott Jackson is the next study I'd like to go over. Um, he's the one that helped with the initial installation of the Henry Street Tunnels. And in 2003, quite a few years later, he made suggestions about amphibian tunnels and installation of amphibian tunnels. Um, he suggested that culverts should be at least two feet by two feet, which is substantially larger than the ones at Henry Street. Um, they should have a sandy substrate at the bottom of the tunnels um, and a grate to allow airflow circulation, um, which the Henry Street tunnels do have a great, um, they do not have a sandy substrate at the bottom. Uh, and then an interesting one by Splat. Um, in British Columbia, they were looking at fencing solutions um, to their current tunnels, and they tested a bunch of different materials and ways to install the tunnels. Um, and they also installed mesh cones to allow for movement over the tunnels from the other side. Um, so here is a picture of the different types of materials that they used um, to determine what they wanted to use and what would be mo the most efficient. Uh, the first is fabric, which I saw a lot of other um, salamander tunnels use. Aqua mesh, which is very similar to what the Henry Street tunnels have right now on the east side, um, puckboard, and ACO. Um, the fabric, puckboard, and ACO materials worked uh, fairly well to deter them from climbing over, um, but very similar to the problem that Henry Street is having, having the aqua mesh allowed the amphibians to climb over easily even with the hanging over, like, the lip. Um, so, the SPLAT project ultimately chose fabric because of the ease of installation across rough terrain versus the puckboard or the ACO material. Um, what's important is the bottom of the fence was uh, built in a trench and buried because salamanders dig by nature, um, and so they wanted to avoid the salamanders digging under the tunnels. And they also installed a hanging lip, which you can see in this photo, um, to deter them from climbing over, and it almost doesn't allow the salamanders to crawl over. And then and then this slide is the uh, mesh cone that was installed on the row side to allow for movement over the tunnels. Um, it's important in these types of installations that you don't want to restrict the movement um, going back over or if ones get stuck in between the fences and the roadway. Uh, you want them to be able to easily go over without turning back around or having to walk all the way across um, the fencing again. Uh, and now I'm going to go over the different land use challenges at this site. Um, so I pulled the parcel data from the town of Amherst assessor's office. Um, and so the red star is in upland habitat and is to the east of the Henry Street Salamander Tunnels. Um, this is privately owned by a logging company. And to the west of the Salamander Tunnels, in between the roadway and the Vernal Pool um, habitat, 
There is also a privately owned parcel, which is indicated by the blue star. Um, the vernal pool land, or the land that the vernal pools lie on, which is indicated by the pink star. Um, this is owned by the town, and it is protected. It is categorized as conservation land for the town of Amherst. Um, I only found really one local um, organization that helps with land acquisition for conservation purposes, and that is the Kestrel Land Trust. Um, and that would probably be the primary resource for the Hitchcock Center to look into um, potentially getting the land for conservation of the salamanders. Uh, now for the overall discussion of what I found. Um, as far as the tunnel infrastructure goes, um, the Henry Street Salamander Tunnels are smaller than almost all of the newer tunnels that were installed um, after 1987. Um, and also with the current infrastructure in place now, the data is inefficient um, to determine if infrastructure of the actual tunnels is the problem. Um, and this is mainly due to the drift fencing. Um, salamanders can very easily pass over the fencing um, because of the material of that was used. Uh, the mesh creates little footholds for the salamanders to easily climb and cross over. And it is deteriorating in many places. So it is lower than it should be and allowing for the salamanders to just climb over easily. Uh, and then monitoring populations. Uh, right now, they don't have a very robust monitoring program. And I think that could be uh, expanded upon um, by doing yearly egg mass counts and also um, keeping track of adults that pass over the roadway during the migration season. And they can also utilize wildlife cameras um, that have use of time-lapse video. Um, so they, if there are multiple nights where it is rainy and cold and have the, has the conditions for salamanders to cross and they don't have enough volunteers, they can place the cameras at the entrances of the tunnels. Um, and they can also reverse that during uh, the summertime to see if any of the young adults are using the tunnels to go back up into the uplands. And then I did find a couple of funding opportunities. The first is the Dan M. D. Giacomo um, FCS, uh, FC Sal small grant. Um, this gives grants specifically to salamander projects, and it was really the only one that would give um, money to salamanders only. Um, and then the other one is the alongside, alongside Wildlife Grant. Um, this one has a specific salamander initiative that will give small grants for educating people about salamanders, uh, which the Hitchcock Center does have these programs but they could incorporate the salamander tunnels somehow and qualify the salamander tunnels for this grant. Um, so finally, the upgrades to the fences should be priority over potentially replacing the tunnels because of all the, the problems uh, with salamanders crossing over the road. Uh, and also, there should be a focus on sufficient data collection and monitoring. Um, they should do egg mass counts, and they should also look at the adults passing through the tunnels and over the road each year. And this will help determine the efficacy of the tunnels and if any improvements are needed to replace the tunnels with larger structures. And that is the end of my project. I hope you all enjoyed. Thank you.